So, uh, I'm Alex Nicol, as I say, from Arista Networks. I'm the tech lead in the UK. So, what I was going to do, I think I've got half an hour or so. So, for you who are not familiar with Arista, I was just going to give you a quick overview of who Arista is. Okay. And then, really, what I was going to kind of focus on is really the, the trends that we are seeing inside the data center, right? But relevant to our market. So, our market is that switching routing market inside the data center. So, I was going to talk about those trends that we are seeing and how we have kind of approach them in a very disruptive manner, okay? So if you're not already familiar with Arista, so company we founded in 2004, we actually uh, shipped our first product in 2008. So we have been about now seven years as a company shipping product. We're now a I it went IPO, IPO June last year, now running about market cap wide, $5 billion, okay? Now, in terms of market share, and this is probably where interesting you haven't already aware of this, there is we're seen as number two in the market, right? So that's inside the data center. So what we do is obviously switching and routing, okay? And what we're predominantly focused on is that transition we've talked about today from a virtualized perspective where you've got servers, one-to-one -one mapping between your server and your application to a virtualized environment, right? Which is then going to drive up the adoption of 10 gig. Right, driving up 10 gig adoption, which drives up 40 gig and then potentially 100 gig. So our focus as a product is in that adoption side of the data center, where you're moving from 10 gig to high density 40 gig and 100 gig. Okay. So in terms of market share, we, we are sitting there as number two in the market. Okay. In uh, terms of type of customers we have, we have customers obviously in the finances, so the large, as someone said earlier on, that British bank, with it, it's got the blue logo. Citibank, Morgan Stanley, but more importantly as well, and what you're seeing some of the trends I'm going to cover here, is a lot of our shipment of those ports is in the large cloud providers you see today, right? So when I say the large cloud providers, these are your Googles, your Ebays, your Facebooks, your LinkedIn. So what we are seeing is some of the trends that they started four or five years ago, we're now seeing them trickle down into the enterprise. Okay, and that's where we've seen that adoption in the finance or high-end tech, where they've taken some of the technologies that were pushed into the cloud, and then they have been adopted inside enterprise. Okay. So just again, I put up the Gartner quadrant because one, it makes us look very good. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's interesting about the Gartner quadrant is this whole talk we've talked about today about disruption. So the Gartner quadrant uh, is only actually existed for the data center since 2013, right? I think that's the first point. The first point here is the Gart Gartner recognised in 2013. Prior to that, if you sold a switch, where you sold it in the campus, or where you sold it in the data center, the requirements are exactly the same. Right? So therefore, where you sold it in the campus or the data center, you would sit inside the switching routing quadrant for Gartner. Right? But in 2013, there was a recognition from Gartner that actually what's required and what's been shipped into the data center is a completely different product and a different set of requirements to what would be shipped inside the campus. Right? So that's the first thing I would take from the Gartner quadrant. Right? So that means in 2013, the top right-hand corner where you would normally see your classic vendors, your Junipers and your Cisco sitting there, don't sit there. Right? Because this is seen as a very disruptive, different challenges, so they're not automatically in the top right-hand corner. Right? The other interesting point is there is some vendors you might classify as, well, they are network and switching vendors. So you have, for example, VMware there, okay? and that's where they've got their NSX product. And then we're sitting in the top, moving in the right-hand corner. So we have constantly moved up, up and out as we're seen as a vision inside the market, okay? I could go through, I mean, quickly, just to give you an idea, what we're talking about in terms of market share, company-wise. So we have constantly grown year on year since 2011. So we're now sitting here as a market share, but 12% of that market inside the data center, okay? So 12% of the port ships inside the data center would be a risk of port, okay? Probably good. I put these up just again to put it qualify and if you're familiar with other vendors, your classic networking vendors, I would call them. So that's double the amount of 10 gig ports you would be shipping from a Juniper or a Brickwood perspective. Right? And even from a 40 gig perspective, if you look at Cisco, we're now shipping the same amount of ports as Cisco. Right? So you might not have heard of us, but we're actually doing quite a lot of business. Right? And what it means uh, for me is when I start talking about these trends, they have some relevance, right? So because they are being used in the cloud environments. Right? So talking about those trends, I mean, the most obvious one in the data center is what everybody knows as Moore's Law, right? So Moore's Law, if you're not aware, is 
is this statement by Gordon Moore, for, uh, the founder of Intel, that every two years, the amount of transistors you can put on a square inch of silicon is going to double, right? So we kind of are all familiar with that. Right? And then in 1972, he kind of qualified that even further to say, actually, it's going to double roughly every 18 months, right? And as you're probably aware, we've been experiencing that on a daily basis and a yearly basis in a server environment, right? You've seen in a server since, for the past 40 years, that Moore's law has carried through, right? Every year, every two years, you've doubled the CPU pr processing power of your server, right? So therefore, and over that 40 year period, you've got a million fold performance, right? And that's projected to continue for the next 10, 12 years with a hundred fold increase or even beyond that. So what that's meant from a data center perspective is obviously now you've got the commoditization of your server, right? So now you're just every year, every two years, you're just buying the latest piece of hardware, okay? But as you get the performance increasing, the cost of the hardware is not dramatically going up. It's only going up incremental. But if you take the same Moore's law and you introduce it into networking, we have not achieved Moore's law in networking, right? So this is kind of a graph that tracks, it's only over a 10 year period, but over the 10 year period, and when I talk about Moore's law, what I'm talking about here is processing power of the switch and physical density of the switch, how many ports you can put on the switch. Over a 10 year period, we're roughly running at 12, 12 times the performance every 10 years. Nowhere near that million fold performance you've got on a server, right? And the reason for that is very simple, right? If you look at your classic networking vendors, they come to the market and what they're trying to sell you is differentiation in their hardware, right? And they're selling the differentiation in the hardware because they're building the hardware themselves, right? So they're going through a two year cycle, developing the hardware, and they're going to spend the next five years getting a return on that investment, right? So that means your upgrade cycle and your performance is only going to really increase every seven years. And as they bring out a new product, they'll try to differentiate it and charge you more for that differentiation, right? So you, you we're not sitting in a world where the networking from a classic networking vendor has been commoditized, okay? But where the disruption happens is if you think about the fact that CPU power is increasing, right? And we talk about virtualization, right? As CPU power is increasing, you can put more VMs on a server, right? You can go from 10 to 20 to now some, some customers are now putting 80 VMs on a single server. And what that simply means from a networking perspective is the bandwidth coming out the server is increasing, right? So now, 2014, 2015, we're now seeing a ref reflection point in terms of the amount of 10 gig server ports now shipped. So in 2014, we've seen more 10 gig ports shipped in the server than we've seen one gig ports. So that means, if you think about the back to the point of net where networking is, networking has to change, it has to keep up with Moore's law in the server. And the current way networking vendors are approaching the problem, that's never gonna be achievable, right? So this is the first piece of disruption that, that Arista came to the market, right? So that when we came to market in 2008, so we build switches obviously, provide 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig switches, but we put an approach to the market was very different. So the first piece we done was we, as much as we build the switch, the actual logic is sits inside the switch, the forwarding engine, the one that's going to look up the routing, okay? We go to a third party for that. We make use of their fabrication techniques. Right, so that could be an Intel, that could be a Broadcom, that could be a Marvel. That then allows us to introduce Moore's law into networking. Right, so roughly every two years, we've increased the density of our switches. Right, what that's allowed us to do is, I mean, and much as you hear this comment, you might hear this comment on Merchant Silicon, what we've done in the model here is, as always when you're in Merchant Silicon, we, make, we pick and choose the right silicon for the different requirements you require in the data center. Right, we were talking Nutanix earlier on, you're running, you're running a storage in your data center, that has to be lossless, okay? So if you want to have lossless in your storage, you have to have lo very large buffers during microbursts. So again, there's certain chips built by certain vendors that, that sit that, uh, suit that so, sort of requirement. So just to put that in sort of, to understand what we're talking about and what the benefits then come to you, right? We talk about that Moore's Law networking. Now, I kind of drew this out as a map of where we have developed our products, right? 2008, we started with a one new box with 24 ports of 10 gig, right? At that point in time, that was cutting edge technology, and that's what was used in the financial low latency market. So it was cutting edge technology, high density, 10 gig at the time, ultra low latency, okay? And what interesting was, cost per port there was 386 pound per port, roughly, okay? Within 
two, three year period, we then doubled the density. Okay, so same footprint, okay, one U, we've now got 64 ports of 10 gig. All right, now due to the cogs of this, we're not talking about multiple chips here, it's a single chip. That's allowed us to therefore, first of all, reduce the power. You've got double the amount of density, you've actually reduced the power on the switch. But more importantly, from a cost perspective, it's 40% cheaper. Right? Take that following year, four or two years later, and again, this is following a trend. Pick, pick one particular ASIC, just it's very easy to follow that trend, right? Following year, we've now got a one U switch with 128 ports of 10 gig on it. Right? Double the density again. But at the same time, you've doubled the density, reduced the wattage, and reduced the cost per port. Right? And what you have found is quite amazing is we've now just upped that further, and recently in the last three months, we've now produced a one U switch with 32 ports of 100 gig. That's coming in at a cost reduction of 70% to your original cost. Right? So this, as you can imagine, is very disruptive to your classic networking vendors. Right? Where they're trying to position their hardware as a differentiator for you to purchase. When this innovation is happening on a two-year basis, there's no way they can keep up. Right? And I've only followed here one particular merchant vendor, which is Broadcom. But in the middle of this, there's other chips coming out. Right? So we don't align ourselves to one particular chip. So that innovation is happening quicker than two years. Right? So the next, the next point is, the next big disruption, as you're probably aware, we kind of talked about earlier on, is just the different traffic flows that are happening in the data center. Right? From their classic approach of, Client goes to the server, requests the server, the server then processes the request and pushes this, the traffic back out of the data center. Right? We've now got to the point to actually do some level of distributed computing, virtualization. We've got a lot more server to server communication inside the data center. Right? Instead of having a, the app sitting in a single server, you've got your web fronting up, you've got some sort of application server, and you have the database server. So now your request goes web, application, database, database back to the web. Right, so now all that service server communication is inside the data center, right, which therefore means simply there's a dramatic growth in your east to west traffic. Right? There's a lot more server to server communication. That becomes very disruptive to a classic model of building a data center, which would be that three-tiered model. Again, very similar to how you'd build a campus. Campus is north to south traffic, so legacy-wise with the data center. But now what we're seeing now with these applications that are distributed, virtualization, if I move a VM, from server to another server, that's bandwidth that's consumed inside the data center. It's not bandwidth that goes outside the data center. So what that means is you're growing your east to west traffic. So this is then seen the adoption as you've probably seen talk about this architecture what we term as least spine, right? So the least spine is the idea where you have your least switches, which attach to the top of the rack switches, and you have your spine. And your spine just becomes a fabric to communicate your lease. The point of the architecture is it's for cross bandwidth. Right. Any server sitting anywhere, any application sitting anywhere is only ever three hops away. So you get consistent bandwidth okay, and consistent performance. Now, if you go to different networking vendors, there will be no dispute that this is how to build the physical network, this least bind approach. This is the optimal way to get your spend money bandwidth. What you as a, vendor, a customer have to start thinking about is how are they building it? What I mean by that is they might be talking about fabrics because there might be some benefit they're selling to you as a fabric. They might be saying certain feature sets that might be a benefit to you, but what you're doing there, what they're doing there is going back to the legacy approach of selling you hardware differentiation. As right? soon as they start talking about hardware differentiation, you have now fallen off the Moore's Law of Merchant Silicon. You're now tied to that particular vendor's roadmap. Okay? So this is why, again, our approach here, and why we've been allowed to go into those cloud providers, is everything we do is standards based. So as much as we build a leaf spine, spine network, the protocols running between them are completely standard. So whether you want to choose layer two, whether you want to choose IIS, IIS, whether you want to choose OSPF or BGP, up to you, your choice. So therefore, the skill to you adopt this is minimum, right? It's exactly the same protocols you already know, but you get the benefit of the merchant silicon immediately. Okay? And then the next piece really is, is taking that whole concept. If you think about the amount of bandwidth you can now get out of that merchant silicon, you think about the scale you can now get 
of that east to west from your least fine traffic, or least fine, sorry, architecture, you are now moving to a model whereby everything, all your applications sit on the one shared infrastructure. So we're moving away from this idea of building our infrastructure based on the application and engineering the infrastructure based on the application. So instead of you consuming time and your engineering time building inv individual infrastructures, you just build one single infrastructure and everything sits on top of it. Whether that be your big data, whether it be your enterprise applications, or even your cloud, they all sit on a single infrastructure. Right? And that's possible just simply the pure bandwidth you can now get at Merchant Silicon. So the kind of point I'm trying to make here is we're moving to a world of Merchant Silicon, following Moore's law. We're moving to a world where there are open standards. Okay, so how, where is, and if you take Merchant Silicon, you take open standards, those legacy vendors are going to struggle to differentiate themselves. Because where the big challenge comes is not in this left-hand pews, which we spent 20 years talking about is how do we build a network, what protocols do we use. Where the big challenge is coming is how do I maximize my OPEX cost? How do I automate the network? Okay, how can I bring the network up? How can I get it to self-heal itself? How can I remove myself away from manual tasks to automated tasks? Right? And then the right, far right hand corner is the idea of, okay, I can automate the network. I can, I can automate the life cycle of the network. How can I then integrate it with third party applications like NSX we've talked about, do Palo Alto firewalls, FY, FI firewalls, right? How do I make both of them talk to each other and then automate not just the network, but the services that sit on top of the network as well? That's the big challenge going forward. And if you look at those, those challenges are not hardware. Those are software challenges. Hmm? So this is again, this is an exception we, we took to the market was the fact that if you're looking at the automation, I mean, I look at a very simple slide, right? But if you look at the, the evolution of automation inside your server, right? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you would send someone down to your data center, they would get the ISO image, probably put a serial cable on the server, boot it up, put the CD in there, get the patched. Probably there at some point there was some sort of ad hoc uh, scripting running to patch it to get it to the latest uh, version, the latest scooters patches. That's not what happens today in the environment of deploying a server. A whole server can be deployed hands off remotely using open source tools and APIs that exist inside the server environment. Right? Whether it be Chef, Puppet, or your own APIs. You can spin up a whole server without having to send anybody manually. All right, onto the, onto, the network, onto the data center. Take the same approach from the networking, very little change, right? We're still doing Control-C and Control-V, right? We're still copying and pasting CLIs. So we're still sending someone manually down to the data center. We're still doing changes manually. Even though we've learned the tasks that have to be put out, and we know that the tasks we're going to do are repetitive, we're still doing them manually. Right? So this is then where we can approach the problem Again, I mean, it's just like slightly differently again, right? So if you think back at that first slide when I talked about the fact that as a company we existed in 2004, we didn't actually ship a product to 2008. Naturally, you would think being a networking vendor, we've obviously spent that four years developing hardware, right? But as I talked to you, we were using Merchant Silicon. So actually that four years was developed building the software to make the software as programmable and automated as possible, right? And what we've simply done is build a fully programmed operating system that sits on any merchant silicon. Right? What that means, what we're talking about in terms of programmability, when the first thing off the top of it, it's built on an unmodified Linux kernel. Right? That means, depending on your skill set, you can run all those automation tools that you run on your server, you can run directly on the switch. Okay? Because this is we haven't modified the kernel, therefore all the open source tools that sit out there can run and automate the switch itself. Now, again, that's a skill set thing, right? So at the same time, you can just manage this as a CLI, right? So again, it's a stepping stone. You can manage the CLI, standard entry CLI, to manage it, configure it as normal, right? But northbound of it, there's multiple APIs to allow you to automate using the CLI, integrate with third parties. There's even the capability to run your own agent directly on the switch, right? So that means you can actually run your own routing protocols on the switch if you wish. Right? We don't have the feature, 
you can develop the feature and run it right on the switch and rather than wait for a roadmap to be developed. And we expose everything, right? So the way we've done it is all the state on the switch, so routing tables, forwarding tables, IP addresses, stats, all sit inside a central database on the switch, which we call SysDB. You can query that, and you can react to that state change that happens on the switch. So you can now start thinking about how level of automation is possible. The other unique thing we've done is we've taken that operating system and we've abstracted it from the hardware. So what I mean by that is the same operating system, the same image runs on every one of our switches. So whether that be a one use switch or a 288 port chassis with 100 gig ports, same image. So therefore, any automation you do, you can test it and you will deploy on every single switch. Right? So we're approaching the problem from a software perspective rather than the other way around of being a hardware developer who's writing a bit of software. We'll spend the time developing the software. So just to give you a kind of example of what does this really mean. So I mean a very simple example of this. This is something we developed with some of the cloud team, specifically eBay, is on a switch. Right? By default, think about a server that boots up. Right? It goes into pixie boot mode. Why can't a switch do the same thing? So one of our switches, if you as soon as you power it upside your data center, it'll automatically pixie boot. All the ports go into router mode and it sends out a DHCP request. You can then get it, obviously get an IP address, but at the same time you can get it to download a script. And that script can do things, and what we have customers doing is, one, checking is it cabled correctly. Am I connected upstream to the right switch? Am I connected to the right servers downstream? If I am, okay, check the, con the config of the code. Is it running the right image? Is it a right certified image? No, let's download the latest image. You can do all that and roll out an entire data center, right? But what's nice about it is because this is a switch, you can put a hard disk in there, and you can actually then roll out the servers that sit in the rack as well. Right, so this then gives you the capability to actually remotely roll out an entire data center without sending any hands on, hands on site. And to make, again, this is all based on your skill set. You, you can drive it from those open Linux uh, APIs, but to make this simpler, if you don't have that skill set, what we've, what we've then taken this concept of, if you think about that database that sits on the switch, I've taken that concept and actually created what we term as Cloud Vision. And what Cloud Vision really is, is a network-wide database. Still the same operating system, but what the head now gathers, instead of the state of individual switches, it's gathering the state of all the switches in your entire network. Right, so now I have a view, from that point of view, of every interface in the network, every switch in the network, every routing table in the network, every code that's running in the network. But what's nice about it is I still have the exact same API that I had on the switch. So the same interaction exists. Instead of you having to query every individual switch, you can now just query a central point. So it scales a lot easier. So what this now, given that global view of the network, what this now allows you to do is very much own the life cycle of the network. Right? So what I mean by that is you can now, from a single point, Query the config in every single switch, roll the config back if it's not compliant, because in here is a database, right? And every time you do a change, you're registering that change inside the database. Change happens, causes a, a, an outage or whatever, or affects some performance you didn't expect, you can roll, automatically roll the network back. And that rollback can be on a per switch basis or can be an entire network basis. Right? So this is now giving you a footstep into what the cloud guys are doing via their own APIs. This is now becomes a turnkey solution for you. Rather than you having to un understand all the scripting involved, this is a single API and a portal to allow you to do this. So one thing thing's the orchestration, right? The next big disruption is, we talked earlier on, is the whole idea of network virtualization, right? So this is this idea of, dynamically provisioning your network connectivity from a virtual perspective, but also dynamically configuring potentially your security policies and your server battle load balancing policies, all from a central point in a timely manner. Right? So if you look at this, it's really all about making use of all your, your resources. Right? Wherever that physical server might reside, if it's fully utilized, if it's 80% utilized, I want to take the VM and place it somewhere else where I've just either bought a new server or it's underutilized. Okay, so what that means is to do that, obviously I need any-to-any -any connectivity in my network. Right? I need to be able to build and provision the network. 
And you want to be able to build and provision the network in a very timely manner, right? I want to be able to spin up not just the VM, but the connectivity to the VM services in seconds, right? And you can see why this then fits very clearly inside this least spine architecture, because you end up with this any-to-any -any sprawl of, of resources that are not physically located in any particular resource or island, or spread across. They're going to be dynamically moving as well. So where the interesting thing is, is I've talked a lot about it, is, is the idea here, what we're talking about here is, is spinning up virtual machines and virtual firewalls, okay, and providing virtual connectivity for them. Right, or technologies of like things like VXLAN to provide that virtual connectivity across your network. But what's, what's missing from this is, as we're probably all aware, is there's still going to be physical appliances in the network, right? There's still going to be physical servers. There's going to be some level of storage. There might even be your existing router <coughs> that exits the data center. Right? So it's all right saying, well, I can provide VM to VM communication, spin up a VM, secure it in a matter of minutes. But if I have to then give it connectivity to the storage, and it's a physical, I can't, I can't automate that. How do I automate that piece? Because it's sitting behind a, a physical switch, not behind a virtual switch. Mm -hmm. Or how do I give private connectivity to the external network? How do I map it into my existing network, my, exit, my data center exit point? So this is, again, where our integration or openness allows you to not only provision and dynamically provision the virtual, switch, but via Cloud Vision here, where you've got a central portal and an open API, things like NSX, third-party controllers, your own custom controller, or even things like OpenStack, can actually not just provision the virtual, but also the physical switch as well. Right? So what this means is I can now dynamically spin up my VM, okay, provide, put it in a, a, a subnet or a network logically, and connect it dynamically in the same time, time frame to a physical server, a piece of storage, or even a router, right? And I'm doing all that from a centralized point, right? So what that means is this is dynamic configuration. So that means you're not going through networking to go because you provision this VLAN and all the change processes that involves, right? So the connectivity then becomes automatic. But that's not just a push model as well. It can also be a pool model because it's all right, great saying you've got that automated configuration, but you want also visibility from that central point of what the network looks like, any faults that sit in the network. <coughs> and again, back to this idea of having this centralized database of what the physical infrastructure looks like, all the port stats, what ports are up, and everything else, that can be queried and then presented, for example, NSX presented inside NSX to have visibility of port stats, what physical interfaces are up, so you can then start mapping your underlay and, and your overlay together and what state it's in. And, it, and this, this model is, is endless, right? The whole point here is that the, the more open we are, the easier it is going to be integrated. So this same model holds true for if you want to dynamic provision firewall services. So if something like Palo Alto, you want to spin up a Palo Alto device, you want a physical server to be talked to the Palo Alto device, but you want to provide dynamic connectivity to it, you can do all that by API calls to cloud right? Same thing from a Fortinet checkpoint and an F5. So now you're moving in a very slow step, small steps at a time, to a very automated environment. I can not only provision ser physical servers, but also the services for those physical servers. Mm. Almost on time. So, just to kind of summarize, kind of where we see the disruption and some of the technologies you have to start thinking about, right? I mean, the, more, the most obvious one as I started about this, this Moore's Law. So when you're looking at a networking switch, you really got to be thinking about, am I using full custom silicon? Am I going to get the benefits and the cost benefits of using full custom silicon? As soon as I go down to a proprietary road, or I'm being sold by some network vendor and their hardware differentiation, really what you're getting sold into is a lock-in. And that lock-in might be fine for you. It might give you some level of differentiation for your business for six months. But if it really is a differentiation to the rest of the market, it's only going to last for six months, and then Merchant Silicon will oversee it. And then you're, you're, then you're now tied in to that whole roadmap with that particular vendor. You can't get out again. Right? So. As much as we talk about Merchant Silicon, the key thing is Merchant Silicon and make sure you're as open as possible and really push the networking vendor. If you're open, you're using open protocols, then you can take, obviously, we think Arista switch is the best switch, but someone else comes out with a more denser switch or a better switch, you can just plop right in the same data, right? You're now moving to a very similar model where you're having the server environment. 
right? Where you can, on a quarterly basis, buy HP, fall on quarter, better price, or buy Dell. That's what you want to be getting to, right? But the important point here is, some of the challenges you're going to see as you go forward is not going to be the hardware, right? It's going to be the software. How do you automate the software? The uptime of the software, how open is the software, how programmable the software, okay? So what I'm saying to you here is, the questions you're asking to your classic networking vendor are kind of outdated, right? If you're talking to them and asking about port density, speeds and feeds, you really should be asking about how do you build your software? How reliable is it? How open is it? How can I program it? Because what you're going to see, whether you want to adopt this SDTD model now, you're certainly in the future, you're going to be this piece is going to be your focus.